thank you all for coming back to the second day of our uh, workshop. And uh, it's really exciting. And I appreciate the people who are on the, on the web. Uh, and I just want to say to you, if you didn't hear yesterday, uh, those of you who signed up for participating on the web, uh, you're going to get an email from us asking for your input, uh, your thoughts and suggestions uh, for the forum. Uh, we are, this is the first workshop of six that we uh, have scheduled and we're very eager and interested in people's uh, input and suggestions about the forum as well as feedback on uh, today's workshop. And uh, we will be building more opportunities for more uh, interaction in real time uh, as we move into uh, future workshops. Uh, I'm David Hawkins and I'm uh, chairing the, the, this particular workshop and uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the uh, presentations yesterday. We had an exciting day in which people who have developed preventive interventions focused on families and children uh, shared their experiences in developing those interventions and, and testing those interventions and then working in various ways to take those interventions to scale. And it was really interesting to many of us to hear the extent to which the same problems are dealt with, the same barriers are confronted, the same issues people need to develop and, 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 and address uh, across these different approaches, across different developmental stages in different settings, et cetera. It was also very exciting to hear from organizations uh, in Pennsylvania and Colorado that are actually engaged in promoting the scaling of evidence-based preventive interventions focused on children and families, uh, as well as uh, to, to hear from uh, the work in New York uh, on that same topic and from the federal government's efforts to, uh, to, uh, to do that as well. Um, it was exciting to me in particular to hear the degree to which people have been able to bring family-focused preventive interventions for promoting the well-being of young people in terms of, uh, in terms of cognitive, affective, and behavioral well-being uh, into primary care settings. And the success that people have had in doing that and the ability to actually engage pediatrics and fam family care practices in that work. And I thought that was an exciting uh, 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 development that we heard about yesterday. And uh, I was, of course, blown away at the very beginning of the day by Lauren Supley's presentation and again in the afternoon by the panel uh, with uh, uh, Stephanie Lee and uh, Kathy Stack uh, and uh, the person from Kaiser t talking about uh, how do we, first of all, what are the cost benefits of these kinds of preventive interventions? And then uh, how do we fund them? And I was so excited to hear from OMB about the developments under the, this Obama administration in trying to advance evidence-based uh, practice in this area and the evaluation of programs that are in the field uh, already with uh, rigorous design. So it was a big day yesterday and uh, I uh, was very excited by it and I uh, continue to be excited by about what we're about to uh, hear today. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to, we're, we have five minutes before we have to start the real, the real program and I just wanted to ask, if you, if you stopped for a moment, and I want to do two things. First of all, I want to thank the people who are on the planning committee for this workshop for their participation in helping make this workshop a real success. And if you were on the planning committee for this workshop, will you just stand up for a minute, everybody that was involved in that, and thank you. Really exciting. It's so much fun to work with the diverse group of people who say, what about this? We need to think about that. And the next thing you know, we've got an exciting presenter on that very topic. So it's, it's really been a fun thing to be involved in organizing. The other thing I want to ask you, if you were to reflect on yesterday, and say, here's something I realized yesterday or that I learned yesterday, but something that came to me yesterday that, that is really an important realization about this issue of how do we scale family and, and uh, parent and family focused preventive interventions uh, for promoting the well-being and the healthy cognitive, affective, and behavioral development of young people, what would it be? What would it be? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to be as succinct as possible, but this is kind of complicated because it may sound like I'm contradicting um, what I said yesterday about the, the whole issue of it depends. And we ha on one hand, when we talk about scaling up, it's important to think about family-focused interventions and specific interventions like nurse family partnership because we, you can't have this discussion about scaling up and getting the population level um, impact through scale without thinking about the specific and unique context of, an, of, of a specific intervention. On the other hand, this is, uh, this is about the third or fourth or fifth one of these, um, this type of, of multidisciplinary forum that I've participated in in the last three or four months on a similar topic of getting to scale. Um, and uh, I, the issues of capacity building and workforce development, and those are interrelated, capacity building, workforce development, and specifically capacity around data systems, those issues keep coming up. And I, uh, it occurred to me, I'm a little concerned that if we keep pursuing this discussion of scale through the lens of specific interventions, um, if, for, in other words, if we, keep, if we keep starting the conversation about scale from the perspective of the, the goal of broadly disseminating specific interventions, we're, it, I'm afraid we're never going to uh, address or, or, or make progress in addressing those challenges of capacity building and, and infrastructure and workforce development because those are big systemic issues that, we, that go beyond any specific intervention and go be, frankly go beyond any narrowly defined outcome. So I hope we can maybe broaden the lens a little bit. Um, I apologize if Bill or Hendricks are here because I already chewed their ears yesterday about this and suggested that maybe uh, a topic for, for one of the future uh, forums in this series might be around capacity building or workforce development more broadly defined. Great, thank you, Brian. Got an applaud there. Anyone else have a, have a thought that they say, this is a burning thought, that, a realization that came to me yesterday. I'd love to share it with the group this morning. Uma. First, I think uh, I would say not being uh, in this field at all, I was very excited that there are sufficient interventions and opportunities that even if we didn't discover some new thing, that we have the ability to make an impact on kids' mental health broadly. So that for me, not being a mental health person was very, very important. I think the second thing I, I was wondering about is the opportunity for continued innovation. So um, here's where we are, but what could we do within the same intervention to get better? If we get 40% of the people enrolled, then how could we get 70% of the people enrolled? Not so much about the fidelity of the intervention, but the system, and I think I'm reflecting on what I, I think I heard. Um, and then I, I completely support that in all scale-up work, the capacity of the system or the underlying culture is really an important factor. So I think devoting time to thinking not just about capacity building as a separate thing, but capacity building in order to get scale, because those look a little bit different when you think about it. So those were just three things that I was thinking. Great. One more, and then we're going to get uh, on the program. Go for it. I think uh, one of the, the highlights, a kind of a high and a low okay, for me, was the elation at seeing that the mission statement of our forum is so explicit about including children with disabilities. Uh, and then to move into the entire day where disabilities was mentioned, I think, two, possibly three times. So the concern about is this going to, are we going to be true to this issue or not? And when we talk about the populations that are excluded, whether it's the 40 percent or the po folks who don't join and so forth, uh, knowing full well that many of those are indeed families where uh, the issues involved in, in a child with disabilities right. is the constraining factor. So uh, both the high of seeing it highlighted in the mission statement and then the concern, well, how do we, how do we actually live up to that? Good. 
David, last one. Thank you, Dave Brent. Um, it looks like the, the Affordable Care Act covers funding for the prevention of physical disorders, but not mental disorders. And one, it got me to thinking that one of the strongest predictors of any kind of these chronic illnesses, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, et cetera, is early adversity. And the interventions that we're talking about buffer families against early adversity. And therefore, I think we're underestimating the impact of these interventions by only focusing on uh, physical, uh, mental, out, mental health outcomes. And I'm just wondering if we can think about broadening this, at least with regard to cost-benefit analyses, and that it might help then to get uh, some of these interventions paid for. So you're saying that there are health benefits, not just mental health benefits. What about the health benefits and the, and the uh, benefits that accrue financially, uh, monetary benefits that are associated yeah. with health benefits that averted health problems as a result of these interventions? Great. Thank you. So we're going to get started again. I really appreciate those thoughts. I, they're, it's, it's really exciting to work with all of you. Uh, our, our keynote this morning is Ann Weatherby, PhD. She's a distinguished research professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences and the director of the Autism Institute in the College of Medicine at Florida State University. She served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee for Education Interventions for Children with Autism and is the executive director of the FSU Center for Autism and Related Disabilities. She served on the DSM-5 Neurodevelopmental Workgroup of the American Psychiatric Association, revising the diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder, learning disorders, intellectual disabilities, communication disorders, and other developmental disorders. She's a project director of First Words, a longitudinal research investigation on early detection of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and she is uh, also a PI on uh, two randomized controlled treatment trials, one for toddlers with ASD and another for school-aged children with ASD. And she's the, PSI, uh, she's the PI at Florida State University for one of the five collaborative research entities that form the Autism Intervention Research Network on Behavioral Health. We're particularly interested in Dr. Weatherby's work as co-developer of Autism Navigator, an innovative collection of tools and courses designed to bridge the gap between the science and community practice, using a highly interactive web platform with extensive video footage to illustrate effective evidence-based practices. She works on innovative technology to build the capacity of the healthcare system to improve early detection of autism and communication disorders and provide access to cost-efficient prevention and early intervention services that are feasible for far-reaching community implementation. You can see why we chose her to provide today's keynote on scaling effective preventive interventions. Ann Weatherby.